Welcome to the self truth and we are uh, coming to you from WTJR in Quincy, Illinois. Uh, it's a pleasure to come to you into your home and, and to teach the word. Uh, we've been in the book of Acts. Um, we're still in chapter 7 of Acts. Uh, we've been calling this series, the, the whole book of Acts that we're going to be teaching on, the Acts of the Unfoot, Unseen Footprints. And what we're looking at here is the Holy Spirit uh, that we don't see, but we see the results of uh, in our lives uh, in the book of Acts and how he started, the, how he started there uh, showing us uh, how we, the church, is supposed to be doing things, and and we see the history of the of the New Testament church, uh, how it got started, and where where we should be watching as an example. Uh, in chapter seven, we've been talking about Stephen. Uh, he's called the first mar martyr because we, we we see him as as being martyred here. At what we talk about today, uh, we also know that he was a deacon. He was uh, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. So um, he's not an apostle, and uh, he's been accused of of. Uh, blasphemy against the temple and and the Jewish re, uh, religion and Moses. And so the last two weeks we've gone through this whole uh, narration that that Stephen was given to the high priest showing that he's not against the temple. He's not against that religion, but he's against that it's now become religious. In other words, uh, it doesn't have the meaning behind it that it once held. Uh, it, it's uh, it's kind of like we get used to something and it becomes common. It becomes just, oh yeah, you know, no big deal. Uh, uh, the phrase that we use in the church for many times is, well, we've done it this way a hundred times. Why change now? Uh, and really... Uh, we should look into the deeper meanings of what what God is doing uh, in our our worship and in uh, in our uh, traditions that we have, because if we lose the meaning behind them, then they just become religious. Uh, they have no meaning. They're just a facade of what life is. So here we are. Stephen has just told him, brought him through the history of Israel, and he brings him down to where his point is, and that is, you have been resistant of the Holy Spirit as a nation all the way through this. Uh, not everyone, but, but the nation in, in a lump sum was more rebellious than not. And even though God chose them, they were still, you know, they seen mighty miracles. Uh, they seen how he provided for them. And still they was following after idols and they was just going through the motions without the meaning behind them. And so um, he comes to the point where it says, you know, you're still um, rebellion against God. You're not listening to him. Um, you think just because you are... Uh, in the temple at certain feasts that you're okay and it's not okay because you're leaving the one true God out of it. And so now we come to verse 54 after he's already accused them of, of, of uh, uh, betraying Jesus, uh, the just one as he called him, and murdering him. Uh, and you didn't, and on top of that, you wasn't following the law anyway, and haven't kept it. So uh, this is how they reacted to it, okay? Verse 54, when they'd heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gashed his, at him with their teeth. In other words, they were mad. They, they was um, uh, saying things against him and, and how terrible he was. I mean, they were really cutting him down here uh, the way it sounds, okay? Um, in verse 55, but he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Uh, so uh, 
and if you, the son of man here is a phrase that uh, we hear in Matthew, who was a Jewish, was to the Jewish believers. He was writing that gospel to the Jewish believers. And so the son of man would have hit them knowing that who he was talking about was Jesus. But I find it amazing <coughs> that here they was railing against him, condemning him. Uh, you know, Stephen here, he's still being full of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> was seemingly calm about it. And looking up in the heaven and God gave him a vision of the heavens opening up. And he was looking up and he was seeing Jesus not sitting beside the father, but now standing. And I find that amazing that this is the only place that I can can think of in the word where it says that Jesus stood. We always hear of him sitting at the right hand of God. But here, because of this, this scene, He's standing. Verse 57. And they cried out with a loud voice, stopping their ears and ran at him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witness laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down. And cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. So here we see that the high priest and all of them that was with him came into one accord. You know, I've been, I've been teaching you from the beginning of Acts that when we come into one accord, things happen. Uh, it can be good or bad. OK, when it was in one accord. Tongues of fire fell upon them and the Holy Spirit filled them. But here we see they was in one accord. And it's a bad thing. But they was all in agreement. Things happen when people get into one accord. You remember back in the Tower of Babel, of Babel? They all had the same language. They was all in one accord. They all decided they were going to build a tower into heaven. And God said this thing, because they are in one accord, would happen or could happen. And that's why he, he, he mixed up their language so that they couldn't talk to each other and they couldn't be in one accord. But we find that that being one accord is a very important thing for us to be in. And church, whatever denomination you're in, we need to be in one accord for Christ and getting this gospel out and not be talking against one another. But then we go on, we find out that they took him out of the city because it's unlawful to kill him within the city. And they stoned him, which was the, the way of, of execution at the time. And they laid their clothes at, at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as you probably know, uh, God changed his name to Paul later on and become a great apostle. But here is before he was uh, an apostle. This was before uh, he became a writer of the New Testament. So this is the first that we see of Paul named Saul here. Uh, and as a stone Stephen... He's still praying. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. In other words, he's, he's saying, I give my spirit to you, Lord. I'm giving all that I am for you. I am willing to die for you. And, it, and you know, he's in a place where it's very well going to happen. And then he does something in verse 60 that that. I think is something that we would all find very hard to do. And it's only because he was full of the Holy Spirit that he could even do it. Because I don't think a human self could do that. But the Holy Spirit was able to give him. And he said almost the same thing that Jesus said on the cross. And that was, Lord, 
do not lay this charge with sin. Do not charge them with this sin. Almost exactly what Jesus said on the cross when he said, I don't, they don't know what they're doing. Forgive them of their sins. You know, and then he says he just simply fell asleep. He had given up his spirit. The body was still there. The body was still being hit with stones, but his spirit was gone. He had died by giving up his spirit to the Lord. And I don't think, you know, he may have felt the first few stones, but he didn't hit feel them all because the Lord took him out and delivered him from that time. And I tell you, here's another one of those times where we would love for the Lord to deliver us from. But sometimes and most time, it seems like he delivers us through not only was his life done here on earth. But it was so important and such an amazing thing that Jesus stood at the right hand of God, waiting to receive the spirit of Stephen when he died. So then we go to chapter 8. And now, uh, now Paul was consenting to his death. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the region of Judah, uh, Samaria, except the apostles. A devout man and devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentations over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging men and women uh, and committing them to prison. So here we see that the church is now being persecuted. Uh, it was first the leaders of it that was being persecuted uh, by being thrown into jail. But now we see that it is more the congregation. But, you know, this was still God's plan because uh, how many we have no idea or I don't anyway. I have no idea how long this revival went on in Jerusalem. But it wasn't meant for just Jerusalem to hear the gospel because God's plan was for the whole world to hear the gospel. So, uh, we find this could have been weeks. It may have been months. We don't I don't have a clue how long, but it was like, OK, now through persecution, I've got to send my church out. And and you remember in the first of, in Acts chapter one, where it says that that you be witnesses in Judea, you know, Samaria and the rest of the world. So we so we, so we see that prophecy being fulfilled here. And we see that Paul or Saul here, I should say, he's all for this, this, this tearing down of the church and the destroying the church. You know, they talked about earlier that, well, if the main person that was leading this, this cult, this religion would be killed, then the, then they would be scattered. The, the followers would be scattered like they had seen it in the past by a couple other men that had died and, and their followers had gone away. But this is different. They're not breaking up. They're multiplying. They're getting greater numbers. Daily, the word says. And that's not counting the time that that Peter preached and 3,000 were saved and, and he preached another time and there was 5,000 saved. So there was a daily going on that was the church was growing and it wasn't just scattering. It was staying right there. So the persecution here was to get people to leave Jerusalem and to spread the gospel. That was the bottom line. And Paul here He's he's one. He is well educated in the Jewish religion system. 
taught by the best teachers. Uh, and he's against this new church being put together and, and, and growing. It's taken away from his religion. So he's fighting against it. And he's putting people, men and women, in prison. Um, <clears throat> verse 4, Therefore those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. See there, that was unnecessary. Sometimes persecution gets us out of our safe zone, out of our complacency, and sends us out. You know, uh, it's important sometimes that God uses those things or allows those things to get us to go out farther, to stretch us out farther, to go farther. And we find out that a good thing's happening. The word is being preached everywhere. <clears throat> and then we come up on verse 5, and then we talk about a man named Philip, who was also another uh, deacon, in a sense, like Stephen was. And then Philip, verse 5, went down to, to the city of Samaria. And preached Christ to them, and the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing miracles which he did. For unclean spirits cried out with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed, and there was great joy in the city. So you see here, uh, Philip, this evangelist, is in Samaria where, you know, the Jews uh, didn't want anything to do with the Samaritans. Uh, and he's preaching Christ. He's preaching this Jewish preacher, this Jewish Messiah <clears throat> to the Samaritans. And they again, in one accord, all in one mind, was heeding the things that Philip spoke. Not only for hearing them, but they was also seeing the miracles that was happening. Devils were being cast out. Paralyzed were, the paralyzed were being healed. The lame was walking. All these things that Jesus told us in the Gospels that greater things than what he did would happen. And it's the greater things I believe, and I'm come to believe that is because there's so many of us that are able to do those things that are willing to step out on that limb and trust God and allow him to work through us to do the healings. And so we see there was great joy in the city. They was, a, they was you know, they was really enthused. I mean, this is the mountaintop high of rejoicing going on, you could say. Um, Verse 9, but there was a certain man named Simeon who previously uh, practiced sorcery in the city and astonished people in Samaria, claiming that he was someone great <clears throat> to whom they all gave heed from, least to the, from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. And they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorcery for a long time. In other words, here this man was that, that was showing great power and was claiming to be somebody special. And yet he's not of God. He's of the enemy. But he is persuading people by the things that he's doing. You know, he is the magician, to say, of the time. But he is uh, doing these with evil magic than with the true God. So verse 12, but when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then Simeon himself also believed, and when he was Baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed seeing the miracles and signs which were done. So here again, we see uh, Simeon may have had great power, but when it came to true power, God's power, when Philip was preaching of the things concerning the kingdom of God and of Jesus Christ, 
and seeing the things he was doing, his God, the God that that Philip was preaching was far stronger than the one that Simeon was 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 showing. They was willing to follow after Christ and they were being baptized. And then Simeon himself was baptized and he followed Philip around and he was amazed at the miracles and signs that that was being done through Philip. But we all need to understand it was it was the Holy Spirit doing these things through him. Uh, it wasn't him. And yet uh, I, I see this and I'm reminded we have a, a pastor friend who is in Haiti who uh, uh, in his congregation, he has four former witch doctors in his congregation. And many of the Haitian people are coming to Christ because they see that that our God, the God that we know is Jesus, and the kingdom of heaven is stronger than their voodoo gods. And I tell you, our God is stronger than anything out there that that would come against you. So know that. Um, and yet he's amazed at this so much that he even became a believer. Uh, now, verse 14. Now, when the apostles were at Jerusalem and heard the Samaritans had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them who when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. So you see, they were believers, but they hadn't received the Holy Ghost. And he's talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, I want you to understand, when you accept Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, you receive the Holy Spirit as an earnest payment. He is the one that helps you to understand the Word. He is the one who helps you to change your life to, to the image of Christ. Uh, those things are going on, but you're not really with more power, ultimate power that, that God wants to give us. And this was gave to them when Peter and John came down and prayed for them. Um, verse 15. Who, when they had come down, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, that the baptism of the Holy Spirit for as yet he had not fallen upon them. They had only had been baptized in the name of Jesus or the, or the Lord Jesus. And then, then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, you see, uh, laying on hands is, is an important process. Uh, accepting Jesus, being forgiving, baptize you into the body of Christ. But this is a... They were being baptized in the water also. But this baptism is another event in the Christian life that we should seek because it gives us Holy Ghost power to cast out demons, to to heal the sick, uh, to get answers to prayer. It is those things because we're praying in the spirit. Uh, uh, so verse 18 and when Simeon saw that through the laying on the hands or on the apostles hands, the Holy Spirit was given. He offered them money saying, give me this power also that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Ghost. Wait a minute. He's offering them money for something that God freely gives. There's the difference. Any time that we come to the point where if you pay me, I'll do it, we are under the wrong gospel, okay? It is a gift freely given. Now, if you're willing to give someone for that uh, as, a, as, as an offering of free will uh, without them having to ask for it, uh, that's a different story. But but. When he's saying, you know, I'll, I'll pay you to give me this. No, it's not working that way. It, it's not. It's a free will thing. It's 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 a willingness to receive and a willingness to give. And God is always willing to give. OK, but Peter said to him, your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. It can't be purchased with money at all. Uh, 
Verse 21, you have been neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of your wickedness and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned and by bitterness and bound by iniquity. And Simon answered and said, pray to the Lord for me that none of these things which you have spoken may come of me. So when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. So here we see um, the correction going on. OK. He thought you could buy the authority to give the Holy Spirit and you can't do that. That is a God given thing. It is a free thing that that we are willing to to be able to do uh, to give. OK. Uh, and because of his his wrong mindset, you know, Peter came down on him pretty hard saying you, you and your money is going to perish because you thought you could buy God's gift. Well, you can't buy God a gift because he's given you a free gift. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And then uh, through that, we receive these other giftings. Uh, and Simeon, you know, and he told him, you know, repent. Didn't tell him you're what we would say today. You're going to hell. What he said was repent. Change your heart. Reverse what you thought. And Simeon said, pray for me to the Lord that I might not receive this, but that I he's basically saying I want to be changed. How many of you today would say, Lord, change me of the wicked ways that I have lived. Change me to be more in the image of you receiving your free gifts as you deem them to me, to work through me, that I might glorify you and you alone. You see, people, we're not looking for a name for us. We're looking for glory for Christ Jesus, who in turn takes that glory and glorifies the Father. Today, glorify Jesus Christ. God bless you all. We'll see you next week.